good singing, actually. All right, let's have a word of prayer. Let Miss Jennifer and Brother Kev get situated there. All right. You ever have one of those days? Today is the day. I don't have them very often, but when I do, they, they come at me in buckets, buckets full as we speak. That's, yeah, like water everywhere. You can't stop water. Um, at least we know it's not going to flood us out because God promised with the rainbow he wouldn't. Uh, let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you for the assembly tonight. We thank you for the word of God and the opportunity just to open the Bible. Whether we're tired or sick or busy or stressed, still, Lord, help us to focus on what's important, and that's your word, and you. Help us to love you. Help us to listen to your voice, as uh, Brother Jake's been teaching about the Holy Spirit. Hard to figure it out sometimes, Lord. Is it your own self? Is it something you heard? Is it the Holy Spirit? But Lord, we want to grow. We want to keep working uh, until you come get us, or we um, go to sleep, as Paul said, and we open our eyes in glory. We love you, Lord. Bless us tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's see. You got something to give away? Miss Van Zulen. Man, I'm dying to tell you about J.P. Landingham. It's such a good report. It was such an excellent conversation. We spoke for a long time. But to do it tonight would cause me probably to do it again on Sunday, and I'll, I'll wait till Sunday. That way, more folk are here. Now, we're going to switch gear. We're going to change tonight. Uh, we're not going to change. We're going to move on. I really don't want to move past the teaching on the mind. But as we, um, and I don't use this phrase, I don't like it, but unpack. You heard that before? Let's unpack that. I mean, let's just study. But um, I'll use that. The more you unpack what God says about the mind and the spirit and the soul and the body, is, um, it's almost never ending. You could just go and go and go and go. Um, so I told you I'd have all the notes printed. I, I didn't. I don't. Um, I'll not make excuses. I'm not even going to promise, but I want to have everything for you next Wednesday Bible study. I, I should be here. I hope to be here. Um, if not, of course, there's uh, Brother Jake may be in town, Brother Dan, Brother Pip, Brother Kevin. We have several able men here that can take the Word of God and teach it and preach it. All right, so here's what I'm going to do. Angel, can you help me quick, please? You don't have to come quick. I know you're old. I'm going to pass these out. Everybody get one? I know. Miss Hillary's up top, and then Miss Jennifer over here. Pass one out to everybody. One to a customer. All right, now what you're going to see, if you look at that, is something that Miss Hillary sent me. I think she texted me or something. I think she sent me a text. Well, I, I read this. This was a text message, the front page. And on the back, I didn't mean to do that. But you can read my, our conversation, and there's two or three more pages of our texting back forth. This is all texting. But she sent that to me because we were talking. One time I asked her, or we, I asked her, um, I said a visual Let's see, what was the other one? Auditory, you hear it, you see it, you, you OJT, on-job training, or um, not kinetic. What is it, Hillary? Kinesthetic. Kinesthetic. Okay, well, so I, okay, there's three ways to learn. Well, she sent me that, and if you look at that, verbal, uh, it's dressed up, and they call it linguistic. I, I thought linguistic was something that you made, Italians made, like linguini, like pa. Thank you, Ms. White, you got that. Nobody else did. <clears throat> but uh, um, linguistic and then physical is what she was saying of, of uh, kinesthetic. And then logical is mathematical. I'm going around a clock. If you, if you go with me, it's like a clock. A 12 o'clock would be physical. Uh, 1 o'clock would be logical. 3 o'clock would be social or interpersonal. Uh, looks like 5 o'clock would be solitary or interpersonal. Wait a minute. They say the same thing. Interpersonal, inter, they both say interpersonal. So, one is okay, so they're both the same learning uh, level, but one's with a group, one's with, okay, that's good. Um, 
then around vis visual or spatial, um, and then oral, uh, auditory. Okay, so I got one of them, auditory. So if, if you go around those, these are all different. Uh, it's a style. I'm not sure I would use that word, but the different uh, methods. Now, God created us individuals from the womb. He knew us. David said it. Jeremiah said it. Others said it. Um, and he gave us the, a mind, and the mind learns in different ways. My mind um, works different from maybe uh, Randy's mind or Angel's mind. Um, we may have out of these, let's see, three, four, five, six, seven. Out of these seven, you may have percentages of each. Um, the physical would be on-the-job training. Now, let, let's, let's logical, mathematical. I like logic. I learn by logic. Um, I'm not a great learner of verbal. Uh, Brother Hiles would always say, I don't know where my pen is, Brother Hiles would always say this, and, he, and I heard it for years and years and years. He said it, if I heard it once, I heard it a hundred times. Here's what he'd say. He'd say, put your pens up. He wasn't mad. Put your pen away. He'd say, I'm preaching to your heart, not your head. And I said, yes, sir. Now, what was that point? Let me get that. Brother Gray always said, get your pens out. Brother Howe said, put your pen away. Brother Gray says, get your pen out. Now, I've been asking for years to get your pens out. And I guess you're, you think I'm like Brother Howe, put your pens away. Um, but I believe in making notes when you're preaching and teaching because that's one of my methods of learning. I'm not a great um, verbal learner. I have to see things. Somebody's going to explain, okay, stop. I tell people, stop, stop. Let me put that in my brain. Let me see, what, okay, okay, now what's the next thing? And in my mind, I try and walk along. I was talking about the imaginations in uh, Ezekiel. I try and learn, but I'm not good. Verbal is not one of the things God gave me. Um, oral, auditory, I'm pretty good at that, but I'm not real musical about it. Well, I like music. Um, uh, visual, uh, spatial, that's something I, I like to learn by pictures, images, and watching somebody hang a piece of drywall, watching Angel do something, watching... Brother Pip, fix something. Watching Kevin do that. I'm a good learner that way. Solitary, social, I like both of those. Logical really fits with me. I like logic. I like order. I like uh, symmetry. I like things to be balanced. Um, that's just one of the ways I learn. Okay, now if you take a minute, we're not going to take long, um, but look at that conversation we had. Look at, look at the first one. Begins with Miss Hillary. Uh, she says, I'm listening to Slipside Fall this week, and in the first part, you say something about women not liking you. Now, why would I say That's a stupid thing to say. In the first part, you say something about women not liking you or what you say. I thought I would let you know with me, it's not what you say, it's how you say it. Okay, here's my take. Now, here's what a lot of preachers would say, in, even in their heart. Who, the, who does she think she is? I've been preaching, I've preached thousands and thousands of sermons. I've done this a million times. I can handle a crowd. I know what I'm doing. I'm gifted. Who does she think she is to tell me? Now, that's what a lot of preachers would do. Now, and what would cause a preacher to do that? Pride. Pride. Who do you think you are? Well, how can I say that? How can I say, if I, don't, if I say it, I should believe it. Every man knows something, I, or woman, everyone knows something I don't know. Therefore, everybody has the potential to be my teacher. Now, I believe that. I believe that thought. Um, I'm not a self-made guy. I'm made out of the parts of, I'm a composite of a lot of people that have helped me down the road. And so, um, so she says, so this is what she says. Okay, here's my response. I am sorry. I have not got to, oh, here's what she said. I am sorry. And I thought to myself, yeah, she's sorry. All right. She said, I am, let's see, Brother Pip got that one. Okay. Um, I am sorry. I have not got to slip side fall yet. Um, I'm listening to Life is a Bumpy Road. Life's not a bump in the road. Life's a bumpy road. And she says, uh, this is me. Sometimes I just lose myself when I'm preaching, but I know you're right. Miss J had told me the same thing. Uh, mea culpa, mea culpa means I'm guilty, I'm wrong, I'm sorry. Uh, I always respect your honesty. And then I asked her, because she was, uh, I asked her if she had a snow day. I don't remember when it was, but it was a while ago. Uh, she says, yes, but it's not a true snow day. We have to do e-learning. E okay. I, I seriously dislike e-learning, and it doesn't work well for my students. Uh, excuse me. I have read, then I said, I have read many students just don't attend when it's e-learning. Oh, man, but for, sad for them and you teachers who work so hard. And she said, well, uh, my special education students who just can, I'm sitting here doing very little. I have a ton of uh, office work to do. It's a giant waste of time. I don't have a lot of work. 
oh man. So she said, I said, yep, teachers and students and parents alike, uh, blah, blah, blah. Okay, um, she goes on, let me get down to, um, okay, look at the fold, the fold of the paper, right in the middle. Man, I'm getting gassed, easy. Ah, I know what I said, I said, I have a question for you. She said, okay, what's the question? And I said, what percentage, or I guess the question is something like this, do you think kids like Colton, my grandson, can understand the plan of salvation, and if so, at what age, and I know the spectrum is vast. I gotta sit down. Ah, here, let me do this. Ah. Ah. Oh, man. Burn it up, don't worry, I'm not gonna have a heart attack. I don't think. Ah. Ah. I'm good, I've just been I was doing a lot of work today, and I've been sucking wind, man. I've been breathing hard, breathing hard. No, I just need your water. Jeez. Okay. Let me get it together here. Willpower. Uh, I have a question for you. She said, okay, what's the question? I said, what? Okay, I asked that question. Maybe not the question, but I guess the age would be vast. The question would be also vast. I know it varies from kid to kid, but I just wondered, and I thought you would know. And then I continued and said, or even what percentage of learning, what percent of learning disabled kids have to, let's see, even what percent of learning disabled does a kid have to be, not to be able to understand? She said, it depends on the person. We serve a mighty God. So there's always hope that they can. However, if they end up not growing past a certain age cognitively, I think that would still count as them not having reached the age, the age of accountability. Oh, yeah, I definitely, yeah, of course, I totally believe that. If they're not at the age of accountability, then they're going to heaven when they die, no matter their age. Um, then she said, well, now learning dis disability is very different. And I said, how would you test for learning disabled? Me, how would you test for learning disabled uh, me, I'm thinking about that chart you sent me. I read every word, and I did the front page. I read every word of that uh, two or three times. Why did I read it over and over? The way I learn. I have to read things over and over, and I have to see it. I have to think on it. I have to clear, get get it. Thanks, Brother Dan. Whew, is it hot in here, you guys? Thank you, sir. You're a man. Oh, look at this guy. The favorite son-in-law. Drag that over just a little bit. I want everybody to see my face. Yeah. The only one. All right. So the question, it went from, it started out excellently. And now imagine all this stuff I learned. I hope I learned, and I want to teach some of it. If my response, I'm not pointing my, the finger at me. But, and, and I, I'm not going to tell you our business, but Miss Hillary and I have developed through a bumpy road, a understanding of each other and a relationship of, past, of pastor, emeritus, pastor, member, friend, friend. Um, I remember one time she came to church and she was wearing a beautiful top. And I complimented her on it. And then I started saying she stole it. She's a shoplifter. She's a crook. Well, you know I'm teasing, right? Everybody here knows I'm teasing. Well, she didn't think I was, she didn't like that at all. Because she said, what if visitors here and they, they hear you say that about me and they're going to look at me and think I'm a crook, I'm a thief. Thought, well, okay, nobody's going to think that. There weren't any visitors there. But at the same time, regardless, I'm not going to say, well, that's just how I am. If that's not something she likes, I'm not going to do it. So we went back and forth and, and she sent me a text about something else I said one time, some announcements. I said something that, that I would retract. But, you know, once you open your mouth and say it, it's a little late to pull it back in. Um, so I got to watch what I say. We all do. But I've all, you, know, you guys know me. I'm kind of a out there kind of person. Um, and so, so through that, we learned. So now, if we hadn't developed that, I would never have got the opportunity to learn this, ever. And this is like, to me, and I don't know what you guys think about it. This, I love it. I love teaching. I love, I love learning. And if we would not have developed the relationship, she wouldn't have felt comfortable enough to call, to text me and say, you know, she heard me say something, I'm just, with me, it's not what you say, it's how you say it. Like if I say, bless God, 
open your hymn book and sing. What the, what's wrong with you? It's like, wait a minute. Now, you can say that, but you don't have to say it like that. Right? Right? All right, so you live in the I'm 64 years old. Wait a minute. Am I six? No, I'm 59 years old. I'm still learning. Okay, so anyway, so here's what she said. Now, I, I'm going to read this, and I'm going to make notes on this, and there's two or three more pages, and when I feel like the Holy Spirit wants me to do it, and Brother Jake says, hey, I'm not there, or you do it, I'm going to pass out all the other three pages, and then on a Sunday morning, I hope, God willing, it's what I'm thinking. I don't know what he's thinking exactly, but I want to go through this because there are a lot of people with there are a lot of people in our circle, in our stratosphere, so to speak, that don't know the gospel, and they may be like Colton, and we may think, well, they can't get it, they won't get it, let's not worry about it. And I'm gonna worry about it, that's my grandson. Woe to the, to the Christian, woe to the Baptist preacher who doesn't try and win his grandson. Now, I would be 99% certain that uh, Teresa and Alex have went through that with their children, so I would assume Colton is, is born again. But I wanna make sure. Uh, so she answers these questions, and now here's what she says. Go down to the bottom. One, two, three, four. Four up. Four up. She says, a learning disability is very different. So I said, and how would you test for learning disabled? Uh, I'm thinking about that chart. You see me. I read it over and over. Uh, Hillary said, learning disability is someone like you and me who just struggles to learn. And that's what she said. And it, I never thought about this, but she's exactly right. I've thought about it not in the same context. Um, she said, I firmly believe we each have... Uh, our own disabilities and not, I firmly believe we each have our disabilities and our abilities is part of what makes us who we are, et cetera, et cetera. I don't know about the other pages, but I wanted to get that front page to you because I told you I'd have it for you, so I wanted to make sure that you had it. Okay, now you can put it away and open your Bible to Luke 15. Let's put that thing away. <clears throat> Luke 15. And verse 1. Goodness. Ah. Everybody's waiting around for me to fall on the floor. What am I going to do if he croaks? Just bless me and go out and I'll go to heaven. All right. I don't plan on croaking anytime soon. All right. Let me get that back. Let me get my Bible. Point some things out tonight. Start on something that we could call it work. We can call it diligence. We can call it being idle. Um, I don't have a, let's, let's call it, um, Brother Dan, let's call this, this Bible study um, diligence. Let's use the word diligence. All right, Luke 15, uh, verse number, look at 14, verse number 25. <sighs> 14, 25, okay, four, man, alive, I'm killing myself here. This is dumb, but I'm going to do it. Okay. Luke 14, verse number 25. Uh, so Jesus is teaching, and verse 25 says, and there, went, and there went great multitudes with him, and he turned and said unto them. Okay, stop, full stop. Now you got all these great multitudes listening. Now go to 15.1. So he's teaching them. 15.1. Then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners for to hear him. They wanted to hear this new message of this uh, teacher, this they called him rabbi, uh, from uh, Nazareth. And the Pharisees and scribes murmured, uh, that word murmur, don't murmur, murmuring is bad. And the Pharisees and scribes murmured, saying, uh, this man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. Okay, Jesus heard it. So Jesus says, now verse number five, and he spake, uh, he spake this parable unto them, saying, okay, um, that word parable, if you look up there, a parable is uh, a story, a, an illustration of a Bible truth. And then Jesus gives the application of the parable, the application once he gives the illustration, okay? Now here's the, here's the, here's the parable is an illustration, and here's the application. Now he doesn't say, hey, apply this, but here's what he says to him. And there's a, there's a multitude there. Verse number four. He says, what man of you having a hundred sheep and this is something I'll get back to in a second. What man of you having a hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, 
does not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness and go after that which is lost until he find it. And when he has found it, he layeth it on his shoulders rejoicing. And when he, uh, and when he cometh home, he called together uh, his friends and neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth, more than over ninety and nine just persons which need no repentance. That's a great verse right there on salvation. Uh, one person that repents. Ninety-nine people that don't need repentance. Well, if repentance is turning from your sin, then he's saying, so one person that turns from the sin is better than 99 people that don't know. He said that need no repentance. So he says, there's 100 people, one of them's not saved, 99 of them are. So he said, I'm not going to worry about these 99 right now. I'm going to stick them in the sheepfold. I'm going to go after the one. One. One sheep. If you had 100 sheep, if you had 100 pennies and you lost one penny, no big deal, right? Wrong. Wrong. And here's why. Look at verse number 7. Uh, or no, we just read that. Verse 8. Either what woman, having 10 pieces of silver, if she lose one piece, does not light a candle and sweep the house and seek diligently till she find it? And when she has found it, she calls her friends and her neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which I had lost. Likewise, I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. Verse number 11. And he, now get, now verse 11. And he said, a certain man had two sons. That's not a parable. So verse 1 through 10 is a parable. Well, verse, what is it, 3, verse 4, verse 4 through 10. A parable. He even says, the Bible even says, he spake a parable unto them. Verse number 11, a certain man. So here he's talking about a family, a man that had two sons. He knew this man. He didn't, he didn't call the man's name. He didn't say, hey, you know Joe Hillman over here in um, uh, uh, St. Louis? He had two boys, one named Chris, one named Kevin. And, and Kevin took all, Kevin ran away from home, spent all his money. And he finally came back, and Kevin got right with God, and, and we're all happy about that. Well, he don't want to say that. Why would Jesus put Kevin out there? Then the rest of his life, the rest of Kevin's life, what people are going to always remember that negative thing about Kevin. Yeah, he's a good guy now. Yeah, he goes to church now. Yeah, he loves his wife now. Yeah, he's got good kids now. But what about, what about back then? And, and that's, that's a dangerous ground to go back then. So Jesus doesn't name uh, the people, the, name that. Certain, same thing about the rich man in hell. That's Luke 16. Um, a rich man died. There was a, there's a, that rich man's in hell today. And chances are good his five brothers followed him. Because he, he said, hey, Father Abraham, send Moses back. Um, and, and Abraham said, the one rise from the dead. If they don't hear the law and the prophets, they're not going to listen to some guy that comes back from the dead. They're not going to listen. Th they're lost. And the rich man finally realized, man, those five, he was the oldest brother, I imagine. And those, my five brothers are following me. Probably they got a bunch of his stuff. He's a rich man. They went and looted his, his crib, as they, I used to say. Uh, got everything they could. Got his lawnmower, his chainsaw, got his log splitter. You know, took what they could and split. They're lost. So Jesus said, a rich man died. He clearly, uh, the prodigal son, it's a true story. Verses uh, 4 through 10 is a parable. Now, what is a parable? A parable, is, a parable is an illustration of a truth. Luke 15, what is it illustrating? A Bible truth. How do they apply it? All right, let's see how it's applied. All right, put this back in. Ooh. Make sure it's sturdy. Back around, get back in business here. All right, Luke 15. Now I got some. I got a message here for a Bible study. We'll work on together. There it is. Man, I get here early, early every Wednesday, and I'm still all discombobulated. That's a pretty big word. You like that word, discombobulated? Woo, getting tired again. So he tells a story. Here we go. Let's see. Uh Here's what I say. If you don't have any heartache yet, they're on their way. Uh, one morning, the phone is going to ring, and the doctor's office is going to call you and say, the tests are finished, the results are in, and I have some bad news. One of these days, your daughter's going to call and say, as it's happened to me, uh, one of my daughters called and said, my husband left me. Uh, how do you react? Uh, the pressure 
the pressure is going to come. But the tragedy is we wait until it comes before we figure out how to handle it. And these parables here of the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the, we'll say, lost boy, illustrate to us how we're supposed to hate, how we're supposed to act, how we're supposed to respond uh, t to these problems. And it's through diligence. So the first one, a lost coin. The second is a lost sheep. The third is a lost boy. Now, I want you to notice two things. Uh, let me write it down. Where is my whatchamacallit? not working for me. Don't change anything. I got to figure out a way on Wednesdays not to keep moving away from the mic. You know, we have a lapel mic. We need to practice with that. Okay, Dan? The lapel mic, you know, can you hear me, Dan? Dan, can you hear me? Okay, we need to, uh, we need to work with that so I can move around. All right, stop worrying about me and let's think about our Let's think about our Bible study. I'm going to sit here. I'm not going to write it down. I'll have it written down for you next Wednesday. Is that good? Everybody okay with that? All right, thank you. All right, let me sit. Ugh. Huh. You guys deserve better than this. I'm sorry. I really am. Thank you. Okay, two things I want you to notice. If I had the energy, I'd write it down. Number one. The same diligence was used for all three. Get that? Now, you can't compare a lost coin with a lost sheep. And you can't compare a lost sheep with a lost boy. Um, but in all three, the same diligence, the same work ethic, the same energy was put in to find each lost item. Lost sheep, lost coin, lost boy. If I had 100 sheep and one of them got away, I would think I'd stay with the 99 and say, well, the one that got away, oh, well, predators are going to get it. I still have 99. I need to take care of them. But Jesus is saying, no, it's not, that's not what people do. That Jesus is saying, that's not what I want. He's teaching a multitude here. And the scribes and Pharisees were murmuring against him. The sinners and publicans pushed in to hear a great multitude, and amongst the crowd there was a murmuring. And they were mainly murmuring because he was proving them wrong, and he was taking their crowd. The crowd wasn't listening. The, the crowd didn't trust these uh, rabbinical scholars, these um, um, uh, Old Testament um, know-it-alls, I'll use that term, these um, professors of theology. They were hearing a different message. They were, they'd always heard it this way. They'd read it this way. They'd listened this way. And all of a sudden, this, a, a, new, uh, a new stream of thought comes in, and Jesus began to teach um, what, what the Bible always taught, salvation through faith alone, salvation in the slain lamb. Of course, he said he was a slain lamb. I like how he healed the um, impotent man, the paralyzed man, been paralyzed 39 years, um, pool of Bethesda. And he, he says to him, um, they brought, it's when they tore up the roof and they four men let him down. I remember Jeff Hawkins. Uh, from Valpo preached here, Bethel Baptist in Wausau preached here, and that's the text he chose, four men. Uh, and so four men tore up the roof and put this paralyzed man down, and Jesus says to him, um, um, rise and walk. And they say, no, he says, your sins are forgiven thee. And they say, well, who can forgive sins but God only, these scribes and Pharisees, these haters. And so he said, okay, just so you know that I can, he says to this paralyzed man, rise and walk. And the guy gets up, the man gets up and walks. I imagine he tried out his new legs in an assortment of ways. He might have ran. He might have jumped up and clicked his heels. He might have been wobbly like a new colt when they're born and they try and walk. He might have, the muscles were probably atrophied unless Jesus spoke in muscles. I don't know. But I know he got up and walked. And it proved to them, I am God. I can do this. And they hated him the more. They didn't say, Oh, my soul. Now, regular folk like us, sinners, middle class, publicans, poor people, even some rich people, they heard him gladly. But these Pharisees and scribes, they didn't like that. So he taught, he taught a truth here. He said, lost sheep, lost coin, lost boy. And he teaches a truth. And the truth is two things. Number one, 
the same diligence was used for all three. Number two, not only was there the same diligence in getting the coin and the sheep and the boy, but there was the same rejoicing over the coin, the sheep, and the boy. Now, I would imagine if I lost a coin and I found it, I'd be happy. If I lost a sheep and I found it, I'd be happy. My brother Tony made a genealogy chart and traced, traced our family back like, he knows how to do that stuff. Cemeteries, birthright, he just knows what he's doing. And we went way, way back. I mean, it was huge. He made it, and it was, it was spot on. He made it for my birthday two years ago. I put it downstairs somewhere and I can't find it. I have sought diligently. I look behind bookcases. I look behind, I looked and looked and looked. But I know it's there. Um, um, Alex Williams <clears throat> gave me a pocket knife. Knife, a knife. I, I'm not, a, I don't carry knives. I'm not a knife guy. I'm not saying to stab people. I just don't, I don't whittle. I don't need to cut a plug of chewing tobacco like Jake. So I don't, I don't carry a pocket knife. But a lot of guys do. And I think they're cool. And so he gave me that. My, my grandsons, a couple of them carry knives. I've I had some pocket knives that I had for years. I gave, uh, I have some old watches or Really sweet. I think I gave one to Luke, one to um, uh, Houston. Anyway, um, what was I talking about? Oh, lost a knife. Can't find it. Looked in every pair of pants. Looked everywhere. I said to Miss Jackson, I looked everywhere and I can't find it. She said, you must not look everywhere. So it's somewhere. I'm going to keep looking. And when I find that knife, I'm going to rejoice. Well, it was a, I don't need it. I don't carry it. I don't cut stuff. But it's nice to have, and I, and I like it. Um, Alex doesn't know I lost it. I haven't told him. I'm afraid if I tell him, I'll go buy me another one. I don't want him to buy me another one. I want to find it. It has to be somewhere. And we won't find it until we move. Um, the same thing with that genealogy chart. How, and it's big old fat. I mean, it's like this big and folded over. And like, I'm looking and looking and looking. I can't find it. But I'm going to find it. Why? Because I'm going to continue to use diligence. I'm going to find the knife, and I'm going to find the, um, whatchamajigger, the genealogy chart. I'm going to look and look, look. Anybody here ever lose anything? Keys, wallet, license, your mind. Anybody ever lose it? Like Jennifer? She's lost her mind several times. <clears throat> I don't blame her. So the same, so I want you to get it. the same diligence was used for all three. Number two, not just the same diligence, but the same rejoicing. So the sheep caused rejoicing. The guy laid it on his shoulders, came back, much rejoicing. The lady found the coin, swept her whole house out, found the coin, much rejoicing, told our friends about it. And then this, this lost boy, okay, he came home, much rejoicing, ate through a big feast. Now get this. Here's what I want you to get from diligence. If we do the easy as if it were difficult, do, or rather, do the easy as if it were difficult, and the difficult as if it were easy. Do the difficult as if it were easy. Do the easy as if it were difficult. And here again, here, here, let me paraphrase. If we undertake the easy, tying your shoes, as if it were difficult, do a good job tying your shoes. That's dumb. Do a good job tying your shoes. Do a good job with your outlines. Do a good job with your printing. I took a class in college. I'm not going to get off the point here, but I took a class. I think I've told you about this. Teaching um, uh, language arts in the elementary school. And they taught me how to print. I looked at, I, I teach Bible class, and I do some other things in the academy here. And some of the, the handwriting and printing is atrocious. I mean, I can't, I look at it, I'm like, you got to be kidding me. Spelling, printing. Um, there's there's a, a couple of kids that do have good handwriting. Most of them can't write worth beans. And I don't even know if we even teach hand, script, S-C-R-I-P-T. I don't even know if we teach handwriting in schools anymore. I mean, I, I don't know if we do or not. Um, but we learned how to print, here, here's that, a small A, here you go. A B, you want to avoid as many strokes as possible. A C, a D, here's an E. One stroke, two strokes. A, B, C, D, E. One stroke, two strokes. One stroke, two strokes. X, one stroke, two strokes. V, did I skip a G? Oh, I was, I was, I was passing, I was skipping. 
No, it's, it's A, B, C, D, E, F, D, X, V. A, B, C, D, E, F, here you go, G. I gave you two Ds, didn't I? Stay out of my preaching, Miss, Miss Pope. Stay out of my preaching, Kathy. A, B, C, D. Now, what I'm saying is this. I, well, here's what I'm saying. I don't know my alphabet. Here's what I'm saying. Um, I didn't want to take that class. What? I was going to take an upper-level history class with uh, Dr. Rasmussen, who was a great teacher. I, in fact, I rented a house for him, bought a couple cars. He became a friend. Um, Mark Rasmussen from Canoga Park, California. He and his brother Tim both taught in the school. With their dad, Roland, pastored the church. Anyway, um, I, he left. There was a big um, uh, opportunity he had. So he was supposed to teach that summer. I was all signed up. I had six hours I had to get. He left. He's gone. I went to Brother Stubblefield, the uh, registrar, and said, what am I going to do? What do we do? So he said, well, I'll take these classes. One of them was teaching language arts in the elementary school, and I don't remember the other class. I don't even remember. But I didn't value this at the time, but I love it now because it helps my handwriting. Can you read this, all this up here? Can you read all that? Not bad, huh? You know how many times I erase this stuff and get it right? Over and over and over. You know why? That's easy. That's easy stuff. Here's hard stuff. Getting on your knees and, and, and praying until you have peace. Sometimes, I, sometimes you pray, you don't get peace. Sometimes you pray, and it's like, I prayed today and said, God, I told God some problems I had and I waited on the answer. He didn't give me an answer. I'm like, okay, got to go. Catch you later, Lord. I'm not saying I, had a, I didn't have a bad attitude. I just, I'm saying sometimes you have to use diligence to pray and pray, work and work and work. Uh, uh, Love and love and love. Forgive and forgive and forgive. It's easy to work up an uh, outline, work up the sermon. That's, that's not a big deal. But it's hard to humble yourself. I think I'm a pretty humble guy. So people, some people might not think that, but I'm not asking what they think. I'm saying what I think. I think I have humility. I think I'm a fairly humble guy. I think I can uh, apologize. I broke a toy um, in anger, frustration. Um, oh, I don't know, it was a long time, it was a while ago. And I had to go to my, it happened on a Saturday afternoon. And I had to go to my grandson, I didn't have to, I couldn't wait for it. And I went to my grandsons and I apologized to them, Caden, Houston, and Luke. And with Houston, man, tears were just rolling down my face. I mean, just because I felt, because those boys love me. They look up to the grandpa. And that's a good thing, they should. Uh, the crown of old men are their children's children. And I, knew, and I knew I'd done wrong. But if I had just said, hey, guys, I'm sorry, just, it, stuff happens. But the fact that God has allowed me, I'm not, I don't think I'm prideful. I, maybe I am. I'm sure I have elements of it. But I can continue to learn. Learn from this Hillary. Humble yourself with a little kid and apologize if you have to. I can look at a reef and say he's just as good a man as I am. Well, he never preached, he never pastored church. You know, who cares? He's just Angel, just as good as I am. Kevin, just as good as I am. Pip, Randy, just as good as I am. You knew something was coming. Humility, humble, humble yourself. Jake loves that sermon or, or that truth. Um, humble yourself for God, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. And so these things, this is easy. This doing the easy with diligence will create a habit in you to where you do the, you create a habit to where you do the difficult with diligence. And the more you do, I had to hang drywall for Ernesto and Crystal. It was the worst, probably the worst three mile job I'd ever been part of. And I've done some rough work. I, I didn't have a, a drywall hammer, I had a, a, trim ham, a trim hammer. I was beating nails into wood that was probably 100 years old oak or hardened pine, one of the two. Hard, hard, hard situation. Um, a garage crowd, it was a golf cart, all, all crowded. I'm working off two ladders. It was a rough job. I was really embarrassed when it was all over. But I gave it my best. I gave it all the diligence that I had. I wasn't embarrassed. I did a good job. Um, um, I did the best I could. Why? Do you develop a habit of that. I don't like to see trash on the parking lot. I'm about ready to lose my mind over all these buckets sitting out here. We paid a guy, we paid somebody, I don't know who we paid, three grand. I think it was over $3,000. Fix the roof. Is it fixed? No. No. Now, 
I'll keep myself from being furious, but I'm not far from furious. Number one, it's the Lord's house. Number two, it's the Lord's money. Number three, I want to fix, man. I am, that's how I am. You know, you guys know me. Uh, he's just faithful in much, or he's faithful in that which is little, we be faithful in that which is much. If you're faithful in that which is little, you, you become faithful in that which is much. Why? Not because you're faithful in that which is little and it's easy. You develop a habit. You develop a, a, a pattern of doing things the right way. Diligence. Seeking the lost sheep, seeking the lost coin, seeking the lost boy. So if we take the easy task and treat it like it's difficult, and give our best to it, then we'll take, then we've developed a lifestyle of doing our best. And when the difficult comes, it will be easy to do the difficult because we've practiced our best. We're not supposed to do our best because it's a big task. We're supposed to, Indiana basketball, I know you guys don't follow up besides Pip, they drive me nuts because they'll go play the number one team in the nation and, and win. And then they play some scrubs. Well, Michigan State's not a scrub. But then they play a team that's not as good as them, and they get smoked. It's uncharacteristic of that team. They got a player named Jackson Davis um, from Greenwood, Indiana. A guy threw the ball away over and over and over and over. And I was watching, I thought, man, these are just kids. Man, these are kids. You know, we watch sports, and we think, I don't know what we think. I think most people think their athletes should do better. Those are children. Those are 18 and 19 and 20-year-old huge men, boys, playing a sport that is highly competitive, Big Ten basketball, toughest conference in the, used to be the, um, what was Duke in? What's Duke in North Carolina in, Chris? SAC? ACC, Atlantic Coast Conference, yeah. Football's the SEC, Southeast Conference. Uh, basketball's Big Ten. Well, the coach is named Mike Woodson, and he insists, you know what he wants that team to do more than anything else? Play defense. Defense, 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 defense. Offense comes off defense. What is he saying? Everybody likes to score. Everybody likes shooting three-pointers. Everybody likes when the crowd roars, yay, I made a basket. I did a slam dunk. I did whatever. But if you'll block out, uh, uh, what's the guy's name, Cop, Coop? Miller, is it Miller? Yeah, white boy from Northwestern, Miller Coop. The guy plays great bat. He's always on the floor. You know that? Why? Because he plays the game the right way. Plays the game right, sets picks, screens, knows how to play the ball, knows how to play the game. Doesn't have the natural 6'6". Six, six. He doesn't have the natural, the athletic ability with some of these other guys, but the guy plays the game the right way. I, I, I didn't know anything about the guy. I saw an interview um, where he said he grew up with three brothers, so there was four of them in, a, in the driveway in the backyard. And he said his dad made him play all by the rules. And they learned, their, his, dad was their, his, his dad was their coach, and they learned the game the right way. Nothing kills me more than watching basketball when guys don't play the right way. Play the game the right way. If you do it the right, do the small things as good as you can, then when the big t things come, you'll do that right too. Key, key truth here. So same diligent, same rejoicing. And when, so if, if you heard me say this a million times, whatsoever your hand finds to do, do it with your might. Give it all you've got. Treat everything like it was a Super Bowl. I don't mean stress diligence. And then finally, when the problems come or the heartache comes, the open heart surgery, the cancer, the loss of a parent, the, I remember when you thought your mom was going to come live with you and everything was going to be groovy. It didn't quite turn out that way. Hope deferred making the heart sick. Um, you can say to God, God, I know you're one of the best Christians I know. And I know you didn't say to God, God, why did that work out? After all I thought, God, why did blah, blah, blah. I know you didn't say that. But you might have felt that way sometimes, Lord. And I thought, after all these years, because Brother Chris was adopted, never met his birth mother, didn't even know her, right? Finally meets her after you're in your 50s. Met her in his 50s all this time, and he had very good adoptive parents. He finally meets her. You, you watch TV, the long-lost mom, the long-lost dad, the long-lost kid, oh, it's all hugs and kisses, and everybody goes, you know, and they lived happily ever after. That's not life. That's not real life. Come to church, going to sit for an hour, going to pray, going to reflect, and then it's water. Can't find a rag. I was looking for a rag to clean that board off. Couldn't find a rag anywhere. I searched and searched. Went down the kitchen. I was already steaming when I came here. Not at Miss J, obviously, but something else, somebody. You know, I love people, but sometimes they can get on your nerves. 
They can do that, can't they? So I get over here, and then I end up, I won't say the mood got me, but my mental frame of mind was not good, and I was mad. I wasn't rude to anybody, but I was loud, and I was, I was mad. Um, and I had to get on my knee out here in this floor and say, God, you're giving me an opportunity to open your word and teach the Bible to Christians. How in the world can my mind be like this? Why am I so upset? And I had a little talk with the Lord and didn't fix everything. But I, we're here doing a Bible study. And I'm trying to give it the same diligence I was preaching to 10,000 people. I've never preached to 10,000, but I've preached to a couple thousand. Do your best diligence, all right? So I want you to get this. I want you to remember this. Um, if we do the small task properly with all our might, we'll be prepared when the heartache, the burden, the problem comes. Uh, Brother Chris and his mother, uh, Brother Kevin and his mother, um, my open heart surgery, uh, my constant, uh, you don't see it, maybe you do, but I know I am cognitively impaired because of those minor strokes I had. There have been times, Mr. Jackson will vouch for this, um, I, can't even, I can't pronounce a word. When I was in the hospital, I couldn't even remember, I didn't know where I was. They were asking me, do you know where you are? Do you know where you are? I'm like, I'm in a hospital. Like, do you know where you are? I said, a hospital. I wanted to call Miss Jackson. I needed some things. I couldn't remember a number. I couldn't remember any numbers. I, I, I didn't know Jake's. I didn't know Sarah's. I didn't know Miss J's. I could not remember a phone. I, I didn't know my own number. I didn't know it. Okay, I've always, I've never been physically strong or anything, but I've had a good brain, a good mind. And I've learned a lot. And I like to memorize. I like to read, 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 learn, learn, learn. Um, and that could depress me. At times it has Depre depressed me. Um, I've lost a bunch of teeth. Um, I can keep going about problems. But if you let, if you don't, if you let those things, if you let things, life get to you, you will slack up on the little things. You'll say, who cares? What's the point? Why bother? I could have, this thing tonight, I could have said, hang it. I don't care. I'll just get up from the pulpit and teach. But I, I refuse. I was watching a documentary about Teddy Roosevelt. It's on History Channel, History Vault. I like History Channel. Um, four hours. It's broken up. But it, how many know anything about Teddy Roosevelt? Some? Did you know he's very, very weak as a child, asthmatic? Um, they kept him home all the time because they didn't let him get out much. He, find, he, he began to train his body. His dad bought a, a punching bag, big punching bag, built a little gym in their house. They lived on uh, I think Madison Avenue in New York City. Um, very rich people, the Roosevelt's. And when he was about 10, 11 years old, he said, you got to strengthen your body, Teddy. They called him Teddy, T-E-E-D-I-E, -E -E, Teddy. Um, you have to strengthen your body. And Teddy Roosevelt began to strengthen his body, strengthen his body, until he became the boxing champ at Harvard. His, uh, he was 24 years old. He was an assemblyman in New York City, um, had a sanitation or something like that when they were trying to help the city. And he, he got news that his, he had to rush home. No, he's in Albany, where the state government is in New York. He was in Albany. And he, he, somebody, he got a telegram that his mother was on her deathbed. His wife was sick also. He rushes home. His dad already passed away four years earlier. His mother dies within a few days of him getting there. His wife dies on the same day that his mother dies, in the same house, same day, like a few hours apart. He's crushed. He's absolutely tore down to the ground. He, he resigns his position. He goes out west. He ends up in the Badlands, South Dakota. He becomes a cowboy, a rootin' tootin', gun shoot. He was very nearsighted, wore glasses. Um, a root, didn't drink alcohol, never smoked, never cursed. Never smoked, never drank, never cursed. I think he smoked a little weed, but other than that, he didn't. <laughs> never, never smoked, never drank, never cursed. He had incredible will. He went out west. He became a cowboy. And I could tell you some stories about it. He was in a, a saloon one time. That's where he went. He wasn't drinking. He was in a saloon. And the guy came in and wanted a bottle on credit. And the guy, the bartender, I guess, said, um, you don't have any credit here. Um, or your credit's all filled up, whatever. So here's, here's uh, the dude, four eyes, sitting there at a table. I don't know what he was doing, eating or reading or something. He was sitting at the table with his back turned to the bar. And the guy comes up, kind of hits him in the arm, says, give me a bottle on his account. Dude, give me a bottle on the dude's account. Put on the dude's account. And so he's sitting there, he looks up, he's, and the guy, this rough, tough, whatever he was, roughneck, says to Teddy Roosevelt, um, 
Is that all right with you, dude? And Teddy Roosevelt said, sure, no problem. And he stood up, one punch, knocked the guy out, pow. Guy, I mean, knocked him at one I saw that happen. Rocky Schmidt did that to a biker. Saw it happen. Was there when it happened. Um, knocked him out. He's laying there. People were like, whoa. Teddy Roosevelt, through his mind, through willpower, became a boxing champ, became a physical man, became a man of the West, hunted buffalo, uh, hung out with Indians, spoke Sioux, Lakota Sioux. The guy was incredible. He did all that through his mind, through willpower, willpower. I don't know if Teddy Roosevelt was saved. I don't think he was. I'm not sure. Actually, I, it was interesting where his dad said to him, Teddy, if you're going to go up and be a good man, a good father, a good husband, he said a good, now here's what he said. Here's what the, docu, docu, the narrator said. His father said to him, it was in a letter, a good Christian man. Now, you have to remember back then, Christian meant, in a lot of places, morality. Christianity meant morality. You were a good person. If you went to the Episcopal church or you went to the dead church somewhere, they don't teach the salvation by faith. But they believe Christianity meant morality. Uh, not everybody, but he said a good Christian man, the YMCA, the Young Men's Christian Association. So uh, he, um, he went out west, strengthened his body. He came back um, and, and became just who he became, Teddy Roosevelt. Great. I love Teddy Roosevelt. I, I have a book about him. I don't... I'm not uh, real um, uh, knowledgeable about Teddy Roosevelt, but I like his story. How did he do that? Diligence. How did he do that? The, he took every easy task as if it was difficult, and the difficult task as if it was hard. Um, a boxer gets in a, in a, a boxing ring. Mike, Mike, uh, Mike uh, Tyson. He knocks everybody out. He just blam, blam, blam. Everybody gets knocked out. Uh, he finally fights, man, what was the name of the guy that knocked out Tyson? No, it was Buster Douglas. So he's like 40, Tyson's like 42 and 0. What happened? He's been fighting a bunch of guys. No big work for him. He didn't, uh, cuss Amato was his trainer, C U S, and that doesn't mean a cuss word. Amato, A M A T O, cuss Amato was his trainer. Um, he, he learned from Amato Tyson, and, and Amato had trained um, Angelo Dundee, and Amato had trained um, Muhammad Ali plus other boxers. But t they kept warning Tyson, warning Tyson. I remember reading after it happened, not on my phone, they didn't do that back then. He had to buy a newspaper, reading the newspaper, how Tyson took Douglas lightly, and Douglas knocked him out. Why? Tyson did not do, he did not approach the easy task, Douglas, like he was training for Evander Holyfield. What did Tyson do? He eventually, you know, he flamed out. Why? He didn't have that work ethic. He didn't have that fire, that zeal, that passion. And diligence, you can translate that into work ethic. Where do we get that? Right there, our illustration, our parable. Jesus said, if you lose a coin, search for it. I believe the Lord will help me find that knife. I believe the Lord will help me find that gene genealogy thing. I believe the Lord will help Angel uh, and I, probably more Angel than I, to fix these roots around here. I, I can't stand I, I got to get off that. That's killing me, man. All those buckets sitting around, it's like I want to lose my mind. Uh, this water all in the basement, in the, in the uh, kitchen. I hate that stuff. We are not duct tape Baptist. We're not going to be that way. I won't, I won't let it. It's got to be Jake that doesn't let it happen, Brother Jake. But if I have anything to say about it, I refuse, I refuse, I refuse to let this building, like most buildings do. When the crowd goes down, the building goes down. We have to approach the small. You see a piece of paper on the parking lot? Pick it up. Pick it up. Um, so, okay, let's get back to our Bible study. All right, so diligence. All right, five observations. I'll have them written down for you next week. Number one, don't wait for the battle to train for the battle. Don't wait for the battle to train for the battle. Don't wait till the problem comes to try and figure out how to solve the problem. In advance, I used to, I had a sermon I call called grief insurance. Man, I have auto insurance, home insurance, uh, health insurance, um, property insurance. What other insurances are there? Anybody? Can you help me? Long-term health insurance, dental insurance. There's all kinds of things we insure ourselves. Why? We're saying, hey, we might have a cavity one day. Better have dental insurance. We might have a health problem. Better have health insurance. We might get in a car wreck. Well, if you don't get it, if you don't have insurance, you get it. You, and I, I drove before you had to have it. Now it's a law. Back when I was driving, you didn't have to have it. You made a law, I think, in 84 in Indiana. You had to have insurance. Prepare for what may come. And when it does come, you'll be ready. Now, some people say, I don't stress about things that don't happen, aren't going to happen. You, okay, wrong approach. 
And I'm not talking about stressing about obvious. But you know what? There may come a day that Brother Pip dies. That might happen. Kevin might die one day. You ever think about that? I might be up here preaching and teaching one day. I might fall over and be, oh, it's over. He's gone. That could happen. So we say, what would I do? I'd panic. I don't, I don't know what I would do. Man, there's a reason that people carry guns. Bruce Jackson carries a gun. Now, why do we carry a gun? I never carried a gun in my life. I never, in my whole life. And man, I've told you before, I didn't carry a gun because I knew if I had a gun, I'd shoot somebody because my, my anger was like off the chart, unbridled. I mean, I'd get in a rage, man. It was like, um, not I, I'm not saying I'd hurt people. I'm just saying when I lost it, I lost it. I didn't even think about the consequences. Um, but you carry a gun because they say better to have it and not need it than need it and not have it. Now, we don't live in a spirit of fear or a climate of fear. God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of love and, and power and a sound mind. Um, I, people that carry guns, I don't know about everybody, um, but speaking for myself, I don't carry it to look cool. That's the dumbest thing in the world. I don't um, show it off. I don't even, I, I hesitate to even say it. You know, a moment ago I said, why people carry guns? I didn't want to say I did. I don't want anybody to know I do. You know why I sit in the back of the auditorium every Sunday? Am I know? Security. If somebody comes in, I'll, if somebody comes in raging in this place, guarantee it'll be shots fired. I carry a gun. I don't believe it on safety. I mean, I'll, I can get it out and show it to you. I carry it in the back. I don't carry it here. I don't carry it here. I like carrying it right there. That's what I, I always have. You never know when you might need it, right? I'm not saying for anybody to carry a gun here. I'm saying you never know. Better to be ready. Why do you, do you does anybody here have a spare tire? You got a car with a spare tire? Why you got a spare tire? You got, Kevin, you got four brand new tires on that car. Why do you have a spare? Might, get it, might happen, right? Right? So if we prepare for what could happen, if we train for the battle, when the battle comes, we're trained and ready for it. Why do teams go to spring training, baseball? Why do they go to camp in summer? Get ready for the, get ready. All right, so number one, don't wait for the battle to train for the battle. Number two, um, then you won't have to think in the battle. Instinct will take over. Isn't that good? Same thing with telling the truth. If you always tell the truth, you always tell the truth, you always tell the truth, then when, then when you, the chips are down, You'll tell the truth. Um, I don't want to throw a kid under the bus, but I had a kid that lied all the time. Lied to me, lied to his mom, lied, lied, lied. He was a liar. I don't know how that happened. I'm not sure. I know they all got brought up the same way. I don't know how that kid turned out like that. He didn't turn out. He's, he's rehab now. God's helped him a lot. Um, but that kid used to lie all the time. And I used to tell the boys and girls when they were little, my children, don't lie, because when the hard time comes and somebody accuses you or somebody says something about you, it's like Jake was saying, the guys were saying, telling Drew that Jake cussed all the time. Drew defended Jake. Why? Drew didn't have to be there. Why? He knows Jake well, Brother Jake well. We all know Brother Jake. Brother Jake does not swear. He does not swear. There have been times I still use words I shouldn't, like starts with an A, ends with an S. I won't tell you the other letters. It's in the Bible. I'm not going to go there. It's in the Bible. It's like people say that. You blah, blah, blah. It's in the Bible. It's like, not cool. Not cool. Um, I need, I remember one time we're, well, I'll skip that. Um, Brother Jake doesn't lie. Doesn't, well, I don't know if he lies. He doesn't cuss. So when he was accused of it or somebody said he did it uh, and they know he's a preacher, Drew defended him. No, he doesn't. No, he doesn't. You, I've never seen Drew get angry, but Drew's a big man. If Drew got angry enough, he could probably do some damage on somebody's head. Stop talking about my, now me, I'm that way. Don't talk about my pastor, not my son. My pa same way with Brother Rule, same thing with Brother Hiles. Don't talk about the pastor. I don't have to. If I'm driving down the interstate and I see a guy trying to drag a, a naked woman into a car, then I don't have to think about what to do. I, I, instinct takes over. I don't have to think. I don't want to think. I want instinct to work for me. When I'm asked a question, I want to tell the truth. Tell the truth. Uh, always tell the truth unless it's to a state trooper and you've been pulled over for speeding. <laughs> hey, listen. Somebody gave me a bunch of jazz. 
said I was a liar because I told the story about driving back from Indianapolis. We were in that little silver Acura. We were doing about 92 and a 70. I got pulled over. Um, I told the cop, this is the true story. I told the cop, uh, my daughter, my oldest daughter, having our first, first uh, uh, grandchild, grandson, and I'm trying to get to Lutheran Hospital in Fort Wayne. So he let me go, told me to slow down. Now, I don't think I said I was trying to get to Lutheran, but I said she's having baby blah. Now, all that was true, except I didn't say she's only seven months pregnant. She is my oldest daughter. She has a, a, having our first grandson. She, she was going to go to Lutheran. I was trying to get to Fort Wayne. Now you say, man, <laughs> you lied to that cop. I did not lie. Every statement I made was true. Yes or no? Yes. Well, I told that story. It's a fun story. Most people can't do that. You can pull over 92 and 70, you're going to get, you're in big trouble because you can't think of anything. Oh, oh, I don't know why I'm, you know, please don't give me back. What are you going to say? Me, I'm prepared. <laughs> you Christians don't like this stuff. Okay, don't wait for the battle. So anyway, tell the truth. Do right. So when you, you don't have to think of the battle, instinct will take over. Number three, and this is so much stuff here. Um, number three, you won't have to bear down for the difficult. Whatsoever your hand finds to do, do. You know, I wrote that down. Didn't even, Ralph, his name was Chamblin. Ralph Chamblin, I wrote down Chicago. I didn't even know I had that in my notes. He was riding with me. He was a finisher, worked for Roller Rule. I was a hanger, and I was taking him to O'Hare Airport on Christmas Eve. It was midnight. Uh, Miss J was in Indianapolis. I had um, Benny on the back seat. He was asleep. Uh, covered with a leather jacket. Uh, and when I saw that, when I saw that, well, I stomped on the brake. I said, did you see that? He, here's what he said. Um, basically, don't get involved with those kind of people. Don't get involved. If that happened to me now, I would have told Ralph, get out of my car. I would have I done what I did. I stopped. Um, uh, the guy saw me, uh, jumped in his van and split. There's a woman standing naked in the middle of... Um, 94, Interstate, no, 94 goes, I think Interstate 94, 80, 94. The Dan Ryan. I offered her a coach. She was, she was petrified. She wouldn't let me, I got within, oh, maybe from here to Angel. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm saying we're out in the middle of Interstate. It's snowing. The L tracks, the L train, they're right there on the right-hand side. People are up there, not very many people. There's a few people up on the platform. They saw it. God put me in the right place. Why did God let me pass her? I could have been five minutes late. If I had been one minute later, Maybe 30 seconds. Oh, she's, she, who knows what would happen? But instinct, to, and Ralph said, if that happened to me today, I would tell Ralph, get out of my car. For saying what you said, seeing what you saw, and saying what you said, get out of my car. Oh, I don't care what he said. I, look, I thump people. You'll get out of my car. You know who Dallas Frazier is? Six foot eight. I love him the Lord. I was holding Chris Lippard. Um, his wife, it's uh, Sheila Tigner's sister, Jennifer Frazier, called me one, two o'clock in the morning. She thought Dallas was in a bar. Could I go get him? Oh, man. I don't go in bars. So I stopped. There was a guy going there. I asked him to get Dallas. Showed, Dallas came out. I said, hey, man, Jennifer's worried. He, let, he was cool. We got in the car. On the way home, he said, people are talking. He was drunk about me and Melinda and Spa because I was nice to Melinda. I'm nice to everybody, especially single women trying to raise their kids. And so they somehow misinterpreted it. I stopped the car, I pulled over the side of the car and said, man, I'm going to, and I went around, opened his door, said, get out of the car, man, I'll beat you down. He's six foot eight. He's drunk. Drunk people don't feel pain. I don't give a rip. Don't ever say that about me. Don't you ever, nobody better ever accuse me of that. Why? Because I am clean, sp unspotted, baby, when it comes to those areas. And when I'm accused of that, I didn't have to think about what to do. Oh, he's bigger than me. Uh, I didn't try and persuade him. He wouldn't get out of the car, bless you. He didn't get out of the car. He stayed in the car. I got back in the car, and long story short, he apologized, and we went on. Life went on. I didn't have to think about what to do. I knew what to do. I was prepared. Life has taught me that way. When an emergency comes, when the flat tire comes, when someone has a heart attack, Sean Barnes cut his fingers off, ran in our house screaming. I thought he was bit by a dog. He, he was bleeding. I thought Max had bit him. He's screaming. I mean, screaming. And I told him, I said, man, shut up. Stop screaming. I said that to Sean, his fingers cut. I didn't know. Miss Jackson, she jumped right into action. Miss Jackson, boy, she knew just what to do. 
Me, I'm like, the sight of blood, not my thing, okay? Somebody's got fingers cut off, like, I don't know what to go to the hospital. I mean, I don't know what to do. Miss J, she's smooth, man. She trained, she taught, she learned about being a nurse. Now I need to quit. But this thing about diligence, Miss, Miss uh, Jennifer plays the piano for 10 of us like she'd play the piano for 200 of us. Kevin leads singing for 10 of us like he'd do it if there was 200 of us. Angel will work on this church building like he would work on the White House. Why? Because Angel is a diligent man. He what's her, I trust Angel. I trust Angel so much, I'm going to give him a key. I think Brother Jake will, I have to ask Brother Jake, give Angel a key when he's through working, give me the key back or whatever. We'll have to know, you know, got to know when you're coming in and whatnot. But I, we trust Angel implicitly. Not only do I trust his honesty and his integrity, I trust his work ethic. He, he ta- he's the uh, um, manager, not manager, but um, maintenance guy for, I don't know, how many, how many apartments are there? 200, 300? 140 units. He's got 140 units to take care of. He's got some guy, people helping him. If he wasn't diligent in the little, did he do a good job for you, Miss White? Very good job. Excellent. Diligence. Diligence. We all need to be diligent in everything we do. Diligent to one another. Diligent whatsoever our hand finds to do. Let's do it with all our might. Now, there's a lot more. We'll dig into this more next Wednesday. Let's pray. Father, we love you. Thank you for the attention of these uh, great uh, Christians, this foundation of TRBC and others like. And we pray you bless each one tonight, Lord. I, I really do. I hope this kind of a disjointed Bible study will uh, permeate and we will find a task to do. Um, Vacuuming the floor, doing the dishes, um, whatever we do, help us. Whatsoever our hand finds to do, help us to do it with diligence, like the woman who found the coin, like the boy who was lost, like the sheep who wandered off. Help us, Lord, to do our best in all we do. We pray in Christ's name, amen.